Heavenly Father, I confess that I believe this sermon is probably more for me than anybody in this room. And yet, God, I ask that you would continue to use what I've learned and how I'm processing in other people's lives. So Holy Spirit, would you be in my weakness and in my strength? And would you help my friends to listen with their ears and their eyes and their hearts? And then would you give them courage to respond? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. I am cast upon a horrible, desolate island, void of all hope of recovery. I am singled out and separated, as it were, from all the world to be miserable. I am divided from mankind and solitaire, one banished from human society. I have no soul to speak to or relieve me. Have you ever heard about or maybe read the famous story of Robinson Crusoe? Once an exciting and original story is now little more than a cliché. Modern media has been plagued with TV shows and movies that have adapted this theme first presented in Robinson Crusoe. They seek to answer the question, what happens when a person is cut off from society and from all luxuries and is forced to survive on his own? Robinson Crusoe tells the story of an Englishman who ignores his father's wish to become a member of the clergy, which I find funny, opting instead for the sea at life, for the life at sea, good grief. He didn't like his community, and so he set sail. No sooner had he started his career that there was this big shipwreck, and he was cast ashore alive but alone. He was only able to manage to get some few tools and things from the shipwreck to build a house and a boat and actually a life for himself. But despite the beautiful location that Crusoe was in, he never was truly happy. It wasn't his setting or the food that made him unhappy. Rather, it was the fact that he was alone. I read, singled out and separated, as it were, from all the world to be miserable. The island itself was a horrible, desolate island. It became horrible because Crusoe's unbearable solitude. This story speaks of the basic human need that we have of community. Humans were created to be in community, both with each other and with God. Seven times in the story of creation in Genesis does God look at what he created and says, it is good. And then Genesis 2 comes, and it stands out in contrast. Because in this perfect, sinless world where man is enjoying unity with God and community with their creator, God looks at his creation and says, it is not good for man to be alone. The only thing in all creation that is not good is man's solitude. Though perfect and sinless and in perfect harmony with God, humans still need community with other humans. And so God created woman to be a companion for man, to allow him to have true community. And although our world is different than at the very beginning, The need for community remains. We have seen that community is a foundational part of God's design for humans. It should come to no surprise that it's also the foundation of church. Studying redemptive history, we can see that church is not something that God invented because all of his other plans failed. Rather, church was the culmination of all that God had planned for his kids, for us, for the church. And when done God's intended way, it gives us this taste of perfect community. The Bible and the New Testament talk about this over and over and over. I studied this week phrases that have the words each other, another. 
comes up 59 times in the Bible. Love one another, forgive one another, care for one another, and 56 other times. To make 59 times ways that we can be loving towards one another. 59 ways to be together. IAC's heartbeat, you see the logo on the screen, is for us to receive and release the gospel that heals together. The past few weeks we've been studying receiving and releasing the gospel that heals. And today we're going to dive in. What does together look like? What does it mean? Well, what does the word togetherness mean? It means kinship or unity, connection, attachment, close intimacy. Sometimes we define something by understanding the opposite. What's the opposite of togetherness? Togetherness is not isolation. Togetherness is not solitude. Paul encourages us in 1 Corinthians to not divide. He says this, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you would agree that there be no division among you and that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. We can all picture division, separation, divorce, disunity. In fact, many of us in this room have experienced that with our friends and our families, with other churches, within this church, maybe on your pew. Somebody said something or did something, and it led you to pull back, maybe even to be in isolation. I don't like what they said. I don't agree with what they said. I don't agree with what they did. COVID caused separation physically. But what I'm talking about is more emotional and spiritual separation. It's almost like we are at the park and we just take our ball and go home. And we live this separate life, this life of isolation because we don't press in. Because pressing in is hard. I know you all thought amen, but you didn't say it. (laughs) Because pressing in takes time and maturity and humility and self-control. And Jesus gives us this picture in John 17 that we heard read earlier, where he opens up our imaginations beyond our siloed lives to a more rich, a more beautiful life, a life of community. And he sets the stage as he, as he prays right before he goes to be arrested and to be crucified. He prays for us to be unified. He prays for his disciples to be unified, but he also prays for us that we may be one, and the picture that we get of oneness is the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit as one. And why is this? So the world will know. So that the world gets this picture of Jesus and his kingdom and his way. Because it's way easier to just go stand in the corner. It's way easier to just pull back. Maybe you can think of a time in the last week or maybe in the last month where you believed isolation is safer because togetherness is hard. I think that's why Paul writes about it so often in the letters in the New Testament to all the different churches. He's like, hey, you're messed up because you're treating each other poorly. Let me give you some advice. Let me give you some vision. This is how you can be together. We also see it in the prophets. Over and over, the prophets tell the people how to treat each other, how to love each other, how to be with each other. I think they knew that when we allow God to work in and through us, we are better together than alone. That phrase, better together, has kind of become popular. In fact, you can buy it at Hobby Lobby. Not today, because they're closed, but tomorrow, (laughs) go for it. In fact, Paul and I have one of those signs in our bedroom. But it's also true in this room and and the other side of the screen that we are better together. To be better together, we need to be together better. 
We're different. We have different giftings and different bents and different wirings. And if we allow God to work in and through us, then the gospel will be received and released in a way that heals and gives the picture of Jesus to those around us. John 10.10 says that the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants us to believe the lie that isolation is better. He wants us, when we are hurt by somebody else, to go into our corner and lick our wounds instead of pressing in. He wants us to say, I don't need them. They're wrong and I'm right. I'm better at this than they are. He wants us to not ask the question to really understand. He wants us to not give grace. He wants us to not extend forgiveness. But what if we did? What if we pressed in to being better together? What if those differences became beautiful colors on a canvas that created what God really intended? What if love and grace and mercy and justice and generosity and becoming family were our heartbeat? What if everyone at IAC not only had a sense of belonging, but made those around them feel like family? What if we didn't just receive and release the gospel that heals by ourselves? What if we did that together? I like pictures. I like to decorate with pictures. I had this picture in a frame in my living room, and it's a great picture. It's one of my favorites. But one single picture alone is not as great as this big collage of pictures. My mom gave this to me for Christmas. It, it's, a, it's a map of the United States, but every single state is a picture. And I love it because it represents all of the places that we've been as a Penley family together. The adventure that we've been on together. I mean, here's one in Missouri when we got bit by a ton of crazy bugs and it was like kind of miserable, but we were together. And here we are like swimming in Florida and going to Disney World and it was awesome. Together. What if we were together and not just by ourselves? Jesus, before praying for unity, gave us a command that same night. Before he died, he says, a new command I give to you, love one another. It's one of those 59 one another's. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. What makes together good is not just being together, but it's the way we love each other that's captivated by others. People want a sense of belonging, to belong to a healthy, loving, including family. And when they see that, it captures their, they're like, what's going on over there? It makes us turn our heads. On Sunday nights, Paul and I lead the back porch. It's like 18 to 25 year olds. And we're going through the book of Acts right now. And just a few weeks ago, we were talking about this, con this concept of like, what does it mean to kind of live together? And we talked about examples of there was an emergency actually during one of our times and a girl had to go to the hospital and half of us like went to the hospital trying to figure out like we're going to sit in the waiting room and we're going to wait and see what's going on with her. We're going to be there for her. Another guy talked about how he found himself in a situation where he had two cars and his roommate needed a car and he was like, well, you can just have mine, my other one. Wait, you're just giving your car away? Yeah, because that's what we do as a family. Another couple talked about the importance of asking questions in the midst of an argument rather than making statements about somebody and pressing in to really understand. It means togetherness is walking together, doing life together. Romans 15, we heard earlier, Paul talks about accepting one another just as Christ accepts us. 
There's like a big Greek word in there. It basically means that you put your arms out and you pull people into yourself. It's this picture of taking somebody by the hand and walking with them. Now, how do you do that? Like Christ did, where we accept one another. We were all sinners, and Christ died for us. We haven't arrived, friends. And so in our immaturity, we accept one another as we are. I'm not talking about abuse. I'm talking about differences and challenges. And so how do we receive and release the gospel that heals together? I think Paul instructs us in Ephesians 4. He says, all humility and gentleness bear with one another in love. The message paraphrase says, pour yourself out in love, noticing differences and mending fences. He talks about being humble. That means like being in a conversation and saying, I could be wrong. When you're in a fight with your spouse, I could be wrong. When you're talking to your coworker, I could be wrong. Having gentleness and patience. Not hard and fast into someone's face, but coming with grace. And then putting up with one another in love. That's the Penley version of the Greek translation. Putting up. You ever have to put up with somebody? It's hard. People annoy us. They bristle us. They're immature. So are we. We have not arrived. And often pride is at work. At least it is in my heart. And I'm in the wrong place. A friend of mine did a wedding and he misspelled a word on his document to like, you know, he kind of wrote out what he was going to say. And, and the, road, the word he misspelled was united. Now, united is something that you say a lot in a wedding, right? We have come to unite this man and this woman, you know, that type of thing. And instead, he put the I in the wrong spot and it became untied. Man, I've done that with my life. What does it look like for us to be in community, to work together, to bring all of who we are and combine it with all of who other people are and make this beautiful picture? It looks like a community that really loves, that's humble and gracious and puts up with one another and forgives and cares for and is present with. What if in the midst of Crusoe's suffering, someone came around the corner? and said, let's go for a walk. I want to talk with you. What if in Crusoe's isolation, somebody knocked on his makeshift house and said, I got you some hot food. I want to sit with you in friendship. What if while he was sitting alone at a campfire, his family, who he was at odds with, his community that he didn't like, came ashore and said, We want to ask for forgiveness. Can we talk about this conflict? It would change the story. It would change his life. What if IAC was that kind of together? Where we walked around the corner for those in isolation. Where we showed up with food to people's houses. Where we sat with the person who annoys us the most. Then to friendship, what if we ask for forgiveness and granted forgiveness for the things that were between us? We have a time of sermon reflection after the sermon. Sometimes maybe we don't know what to do there, but I want to give a little instruction for our sermon reflection time. While there's music being played, I want to be purposeful in asking the Holy Spirit to bring to mind the lies that we're believing, the words that we need to confess, or the actions we need to take. And then can I just be so bold to challenge us to not just think those things, but to actually do them? 
that during the confession time, we would confess the things that we have said or done that have not brought togetherness. That maybe after we come forward in receiving the Eucharist and are filled and saying, God, your truth and your life is so good. I want to be that to this person in this circumstance, in this relationship. And be honest about, I kind of want to just be in my corner, but I don't see you doing that, Jesus. And so I'm going to follow your example and I'm going to press in. Would you use that time to think, to reflect? And then may our hearts be moved to action. May we receive and release the gospel that heals together. Let's pray. God, I pray that we as a community would be humble would be gentle and patient, would put up with one another because, God, that is how you have been to us. May we take what we see in you, Jesus, and be able to lift that out. God, convict and challenge, encourage Breathe life into us, Jesus. Breathe together into us, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand and let us...